In this hour, experience the joy of music, teaching, praise, and encouragement from the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ in this special presentation of The Morning Worship from First Christian Church in Johnson City, Tennessee, a loving community transforming lives. I will worship
reigns. He is alive today. We lift our eyes up before him. We ask God, what, how can we serve in your name, Father? Look, look at the scripture with, that we're going to talk about today. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being f- found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The ultimate act of servanthood for his children. What if we actually took to heart God's teachings on servanthood, being a servant to our brothers and sisters in Christ? That's what we've been learning about. What a difference all those things can make. So I want you to watch and let's, let's, let's share together this video really quickly. What if we lived our life consecrated to the service of the Lord? You know these words. Stand up and sing them with us. Take my life and let that you look around and you see the needs, but very often you think, well, I'm one person, what can I do? I encourage you to think of the words of this song the next time you see a need and understand that you can reach out in the name of Jesus Christ and do something. This, the words of this first verse say this. Ah. 
Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. So carry the sunshine where darkness is rife, making the sorrowing glad. Sing with me. Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing. Out of my life. Out of my life. Let Jesus shine. May Jesus shine. Make me a blessing. Oh, say. Pray with me. God, Father, thank you that we can ask in your name to make us a blessing to someone else. We do so boldly. We approach your throne, giving you praise, giving you worship, asking you to forgive us and cleanse us and let us shine into the lives of those around us. Father, what a privilege it is to be here today. I ask that you would open our hearts, open our minds to your word find out what a difference it can make in our lives and the lives around us and even in this world, God, for us to serve in your name. We pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all of God's people said. Be seated, please. Simple prayer, make me a servant. Sing with us. Make me a servant. Humble and be Lord, let me lift up those who are weak, and may the prayer of my heart always be, make me a servant, make me a servant, make
Dr. Elton Trueblood was a, a leader, a Christian leader, a couple of generations ago, and a well-known writer. In fact, I'd studied in one of his books in college, a philosopher, a professor. We had him as a guest at Milligan College when I was vice president, and I was thrilled that he was going to come and be with us. We put on a, a banquet in his honor one evening, and at the head table sat the president and his wife and Dr. Trueblood and his, and, and Joy and I were there. And he was making small talk with me. <laughs> he, uh, he asked me, uh, what does a vice president do? And I muttered something uh, incoherent, I know, uh, trying to uh, impress him. I noticed as the meal went on that his teacup was empty. So I got up and took his teacup and went over and uh, refilled it and brought it back to him. And he said, now I know what a vice president does. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was right. Vice president, stand in for probable successor to the president. But in the meantime, mostly a filler of teacups and a runner of errands and the understudy and gopher for the president, uh, whose job it is to ease the president's load to make the president look good. He is, in fact, a servant. We want to talk this morning about what a difference your serving makes, especially as a part of the body of Christ, because this is rather different from elsewhere in the world, in that the only way up in this organization is down. And Jesus makes that very clear in the passage that we're going to look at this morning. We've been reminded periodically of the importance of random acts of kindness. And it's a good reminder, just like our love month is a good reminder for us that our, our task is, is actually to be in the community, to be serving the community in very actively involved in loving God and loving one another. Random acts of kindness are a good starting place. But this, this sermon is not about random acts of kindness because the passage that we're going to look at well, there's nothing random about what Jesus does at all. The setting is Jerusalem. It's the annual Passover festival for the city. Jesus has made the arrangements uh, to have a room in which he could host the meal for his disciples. And, well, we pick the story up in the 13th chapter of John, beginning with verse 2. The evening meal was in progress. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. I, I want to pause right here because John is stressing something pretty important about our voluntary service. We don't do it. We don't do these acts of kindness under compulsion or as an attempt to bolster our sagging ego. We're not trying to impress anybody. Jesus has nothing to gain from what he is about to do. He knew who he was. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. He's about to do the work of a servant. There's nothing in it for him. But this is not the act of a weakling or a nobody, which is what some people think servants are. No, the Apostle Paul understood this very clearly. We've already looked at, at uh, Philippians in this service, but I want to, I'm going to come back to it. I'm going to come back to it again. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death, on a cross. Nothing random or casual about this at all. Uh, today we'd probably say that, that uh, Jesus is demonstrating a lifestyle here, a lifestyle choice. It's a deliberate decision not to go through life in first class, not to be demanding the chief seats, not to insist on the head of the line, not having to be in the spotlight. In fact, it means not looking out for number one. 
not manipulating everything to my own advantage, not being served. The only way up in this organization is down. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. And this was going fairly well. It had to be puzzling his disciples. I mean, this is not what a rabbi does. A rabbi doesn't wash the feet of his students. I said it was going fairly well. And then he came to Simon Peter, who expressed the puzzlement of all of them, but maybe a little more strongly than they would have done. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. Oh no, said Peter, you'll never wash my feet. Now let me rise to Peter's defense here for a moment. He thought he was acting properly. As I said, the rabbi doesn't serve the student. It's the other way around. And Peter means well, but, but this is not a moment to stand on protocol. Jesus is doing some teaching. Sometimes, sometimes we teach with words, and sometimes we teach with actions. This is what Jesus is doing here. He had, after all, talked and talked and talked to these guys for months, years, and he knew they hadn't fully grasped what he was about. And Peter hasn't caught on to what this simple act of foot washing means. Jesus is really saying, I'm washing your feet now. Just a matter of hours, I'm going to do something even more important. You're not going to understand what I'm doing now, but after what he's saying is after the cross, then you will understand. So Jesus answered, unless I wash you, Peter, you can have no part with me. Well, then, Lord... Finally, Peter understands a little bit. Well, then, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Well, that's not necessary, Jesus says. Those who have a, had a bath only need to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. You're clean. And then he looks around, uh, but not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet... He put on his clothes, returned to his place, and asked, do you, do you understand what I've done for you? And as I've already pointed out, they don't understand. But Peter, who probably even yet doesn't fully understand, changes his tune. Because it's, it's not a matter of understanding, it's a matter of, of being obedient. And, and, and so he says, wash me, wash all of me. You're my Lord, you're my teacher. And Jesus responds, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who has sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. This is a very serious moment for the group. He's calling them servants. Now, not, not just servants. The lowest kind of servant. In Jerusalem at that, at that time, if you had any money, you had enough money for more than one servant, there was a hierarchy, a pecking order among the servants. And the, the job of the lowest of the low in that pecking order at the bottom of the totem pole, if you please, was the, was the servant who washed feet. Now, you, you kind of have to picture this. In those days, people got from place to place by walking. There were no bicycles. There were no taxis. There were no cars. They didn't walk on concrete. They didn't walk on, on, on asphalt. They walked in the dirt. So when they arrived, they may have started out from home clean, but when they arrived for the banquet, their feet were dirty. If it had been a long day and they were hot, it would have been that they had very grimy feet. And it was the job of the lowest servant to cool their feet, to wash their feet, to clean their feet. It wasn't a pleasant job. And for these disciples to watch their rabbi doing that job, it was shocking. It's beneath his dignity. Now that doesn't inspire confidence. Who wants to follow a servant? We want our leaders to be impressive, commanding. 
a presence. Joy and I were in Korea. Uh, we were guests of several Korean university presidents. I was working as president of our university to try to uh, have some reciprocal agreements. She and I were treated like visiting royalty. Everything was done to make us comfortable, to make us feel important. You could adjust to that kind of treatment. But what I noticed was how the presidents were being treated. Everywhere they went, they had an entourage with them. I never saw a president open his own door, carry his own papers or briefcase, move his own chair, drive his own car. I was so impressed that when I came back home, I decided I was going to be a president like those presidents. <laughs> and I would stand before the door, and nobody opened it. <laughs> Get in the back seat of the car and went nowhere. <laughs> We've got a lot to learn from the Koreans, I, I have to tell you that. No, we don't. We have our own way of ignoring Jesus' example. I just finished reading a biography of, of General Dwight Eisenhower, who was the supreme commander of the Allied forces in World War II before he was president of the United States. It was interesting how important titles were in the military world. He had to be the supreme commander because that meant there could be nobody higher. But then he had to be concerned about the titles of the generals who worked under him so that those who were... Um, compatriots, uh, not compatriots, uh, comrades in arms from France and, and England would understand that our guys were as good as their guys and had as much power. That's, that's just not a concern of the military. It's interesting in the corporate world that we're more familiar with. You'll notice, if you go into the offices, there's, there's a pecking order and it's very obvious what the symbols are that define the pecking order. This person over here only has one chair by his desk, but this person over here has two chairs. Obviously, that person is more important than that person. And, and this person over here has a window, and this person over here doesn't. Now, this matter, this, is, this strikes close to home, because when I started teaching at Emmanuel, they put me in a little closet-like room with no window which said to everybody who came on that campus, this guy, he's a newbie, he's not as important as these other people. They have windows. So I lobbied. I now have a window. <laughs> now my window, unfortunately, is in the closet size room off of my office proper. But Joy helped me out. She bought a nice big mirror and we put that mirror up against the window in the closet. And if I sit here, I can look outside. I have a window. <laughs> I read of a, of a CEO, top dog, who before his, he moved into his office, had the carpenters come in and put a floor two inches higher in his office than anybody else had. Because he's important. And he wants the symbol of authority. It, when you come to, what, to this passage and you read what Jesus is doing, and you're from a, a country like our country in which status symbols really do matter, you understand something of what the disciples felt when they watched their Lord and Master, their Rabbi, cleaning feet. And when Peter offers and he says, no, 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 not just my feet, Lord, but my, my head, my hands, that's his way of offering complete obedience to Jesus. Now, a couple of chapters later, we've been in, in, in chapter 13 of John. A couple of chapters later, same occasion, same dinner, Jesus offers some further insight into what is going on here. And he says to his disciples, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you, if you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away, withers, such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. 
This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. What he's saying is that when, when we're willing to go down in this organization, when we're willing to stoop in service, we're not doing that on our own power. We're not serving one another in our own power. We're not bearing fruit in our own power. We've got a relationship here, a partnership with the Holy Spirit, as close as that of the branch and the vine. What a huge difference this makes. And when you understand that you start with these random acts of kindness even, a love month even, and then you move into more deliberate, a more deliberate lifestyle choice of serving, and are experiencing what it is to be kind of caught up in a power greater than your own, then you realize that the relationship is changing. And Jesus touches on that in this same 15th chapter, beginning with verse 14. You, you're my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I've made known to you. You didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love one another. What a difference your serving makes. And it's, this, it's the difference that the satisfaction gives. The satisfaction of knowing, and most of us feel a little uncomfortable here because we don't want to sound so super spiritual, but it is the satisfaction of knowing that we are becoming more like Christ. Back to that Philippians passage again. Have this same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He's not concerned about the perks. He's not concerned about the status symbols. He's not concerned about coming across as somebody really godlike. No. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. I'm feeling very self-conscious as I preach this sermon this morning. Uh, something happened yesterday. I, I attended the, the wedding for, uh, for Ben Carpenter and, and Corey. Ben is the son of Stephen K. Carpenter, our missionaries to Mexico, and the grandson of our Jim Carmichael. It, it was a lovely, lovely wedding, and I was out in the lobby chatting with with Clarinda Jeans when a third party walked up and disturbed the conversation. Now this third party has been a problem to me ever since I started here. His name's Gene Wigginton. Some of you know him. <laughs> I only put the pieces of this together later and, and the, the truth is Gene knew what I would be preaching on today. Service. Stooping helping others. So he walked up to us and I am persuaded, now he denies it, I am persuaded that he deliberately spilled his coffee on the floor and then watched me. <laughs> well I too knew what the sermon was going to be today so I, 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 I had no choice. So I began running around the lobby trying to find a napkin, trying to find towels, trying to find something. I never succeeded, by the way. Clarinda, who was smarter than I, saw the gifts on the table, and she pulled out, she pulled out some of the stuffing, the tissue, the stuffing. And, and so when I got back, she had got that. So I got down, and I wiped it up. Gene Wigginton didn't offer to do anything. LAUGHTER well, if you know Gene, you know I might have embellished that story just a tad. <laughs> I'm not going to embellish the next one. John Madding. I was in high school with John Madding. He was a year or two older than I was. We graduated. We parted. Didn't see him for decades. And then when I was preaching out in Mesa, one day he and his wife Beverly showed up and they became members of our church. I mean members of our church. The kind of members who, whenever the door was open, there they were. Never in the spotlight, never asking for anything, always looking for a job to do behind the scenes, always 
well, kind of being the glue of the organization, if you please, the kind of people you can't get along without. I admired them so much. We have some people like that in this church, as you know. One day, I caught him by himself. I thanked him for what, for what he was doing in the church, and, and he used that as an opportunity to explain himself. And this is what he said. He said, you remember that time in the Bible when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? I said, yes. He said, remember? Remember that there was a stone in the opening to the tomb? And I said, yes. Do you remember that that stone had to be moved so that Jesus could call Lazarus back from the dead? I said, yes. He said, well, this is how I see it. I'm the guy who moves the stone so somebody else can perform the miracle. I don't have to tell you what I think about John Madding. Think of all the instances in the Bible where our eyes are focused upon Jesus, our eyes are impressed by the, I mean, our, our minds are impressed by the miracle, and we, we forget all the people that helped bring it about. For example, yesterday, Ben's Aunt Linda Sweeney read the scripture. The scripture she chose for that wedding was the wedding feast of Cana of Galilee, where Jesus turned the water into the wine and made a lot of wine, and, and, and the water jugs had to be filled. And it, it hit me because I was concentrating on this sermon. It hit me. All those servants who had to bring the water, who had to fill the jugs, who had to do the labor. Or you can go to the occasion when Jesus fed the 5,000 on the hillside. I've been to that hillside where they think that took place. And it's true, he multiplied the loaves and the fishes and all of those people got fed, but somebody had to carry the food to them. Somebody had to clean up afterwards. People who do the work so the miracle can take place. Or the, or the paralyzed man, Jesus teaching in a crowded room and, and his teaching is disturbed by some noise overhead. And, and pretty soon dust and, and, and uh, plaster or whatnot is falling down. And a, and a, and a door, I mean, an opening appears up there, and, and there are four guys, and there's a man, paralyzed man, that they let down and put him before the feet of Jesus. And our eyes are on Jesus, and our eyes are on the paralytic man that now gets up and walks. My eyes are still back up there, those four guys that did all that work so that somebody else could perform the miracle. That impresses me. I was so proud of us last week when we had the awards that were given here to four of our long-time workers in this church. Four long-term behind-the-scenes workers that, we've, that we finally got to say thanks to. What a difference they make in this church. Well, if you've been following the movement here, there's one last thing I want to point out about servitude, and that is, we do it long enough, we do it in the spirit of Christ, and we're attached like, like the branch to the vine. Our servitude turns to friendship. So Jesus says, you're my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you Friends, the relationship has deepened into deep friendship. Now, as I've been talking to you, I've, I've had another foot washing scene, and mine had happened out at Emmanuel a couple years ago. I walked into the chapel, and right in front of me, I saw my grandson-in-law, Tom, and his son, Elias. Elias, three years old. So I went to sit by them, of course to sit by Elias, and only then did I look down to the front of the chapel and I realized we were going to have a very special service that day, a foot washing service. I think that they do it every year or two out there. And when I realized what it was going to be, I leaned across Elias and asked his dad, may I have the privilege? Tom's always gracious, and he said yes. So we took off our shoes and our socks. And Elias and I, when the time came, walked and got in line with the students and the faculty. 
made our way down to the front. When it was our turn, Elias climbed up on the chair down there, and I knelt. I can get down fairly easily. Um, there's a greater challenge going in the other direction. And I, I took the towel, and I held in my hands those <laughs> precious, unflawed, three-year-old feet. And I washed them, patted them dry giving thanks. And then we switched places. And Elias climbed up on the chair. And that conscientious child, gently, tenderly, with his soft hands, washed my ugly, old, arthritic, nearly worn out feet. I've seldom been so moved by a simple act. And then he carefully, responsibly patted them dry, took my hand, and we went back up to our seats. What a difference your serving makes. In that moment, the generations that separated us evaporated. In that moment, other distinctions vanished. We were no longer old man, child person with position and authority, child with neither. We were no longer giver and receiver. We were two servants without any other agenda but to serve one another. And in that serving we became, without speaking a word, we became friends. So you see, Dr. Trueblood, the job of the Vice President is to refill teacups. But what you don't understand, Dr. Trueblood, you don't know this. I've been serving this President many years before that evening. When he was a pastor out in Oregon, I was his youth minister. And then when he became the the uh, pastor of this church here many years later we came and he was my pastor and I was a member trying to help and then he became president at Milligan College and I was a professor working for him serving under him and then vice president filler of teacups but more importantly and this is what Dr. Tulbad couldn't have known in that moment the long service over the years became friendship. I still had foot washing type jobs to do and I did them. I was okay being a servant but I was serving my friend. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. What a huge difference your serving makes. We're going to stand and sing a song of invitation. Maybe this is the time that you would like to come down and find out what this all means to serve God. Would you stand with us, please? You can talk to Roy and uh, make that decision. Jonathan's here as well. Maybe you just need to talk about becoming a part of this, this body of believers. You can do that as well. Or just pray and then just talk with them, visit with them. This is your opportunity. Let's sing together. Light of the world. down into darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with
praise. We're in the season of Lent, a time of preparation where the church looks toward the highest point of the year, which is Easter coming up in a few weeks. During Lent, we spend a lot of time reflecting on the humanity of Jesus. It's a reminder that the physical plays into this journey just as much as the spiritual. And yes, it's true that the work that Jesus did on the cross couldn't be done by a mere human. But if we miss out on the fact that God became human and lived among us, we'll miss out on the power behind the death, burial, and resurrection. If we forget that Jesus had siblings, if we forget that Jesus had and lost friends, if we forget that Jesus worked for money, paid for food, and even had to pay taxes, right? Even the Son of God couldn't get out of paying those. If we don't recognize these things, then Jesus becomes some disconnected figure, this ideal that we can't really attain. Everything changes when we're reminded that there's a physical side to all of this. As we gather around the table today, may we consider the humanity of Jesus. As we reflect on the ministry and sacrifice of Jesus, may we celebrate the fact that God became a human and shared in our experience so that we could be redeemed. Draw us ever nearer to the cross where Jesus was crucified. Sing these words. And I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy words and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me near. Draw me Pray with me. Father, we struggle to get our mind around the enormity and the magnitude of the love that compelled such an amazing sacrifice to redeem and restore us. In these moments, Father, we come to your table as your children, as brothers and sisters, asking, Father, for, um, to connect with you here and to be changed. We pray this prayer in your son's holy and mighty name. Amen.
this morning as we take our offering in just a, a moment, we're going to continue with this love month of honoring some of the folks who serve in our community and do such amazing jobs. So let's pray first, and Kathy's going to come and share. Our Father, we do thank you that we can even be serving through these tithes, these offerings that we bring to you, but we also offer them to our neighbors, to folks around the world that we don't even know, so that they might hear the name of Jesus proclaimed, that so they might be clothed, so they might be fed and sheltered. God, thank you that we can serve in this way as well. We ask that you would bless each gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the plates are passed, please take one of these cards. Just like we did um, two weeks ago, we are um, honoring and recognizing a group of professionals in that serve our community. Today we want to give honor and recognition to the men and women of our Public Works Department. I want you to take one of these cards, write a note of thanks and appreciation. If you don't know who to mail it to, if you will drop it off at the Love Month sign-up table, I'll be sure that they get them. I'm sure you all appreciated having the roads plowed when we had snow last week. Well, that's Public Works. And this work, this group of servants works tirelessly behind the scenes. But if they don't show up for work one day, we would notice. I want to share a video this morning of what it would look like a day without our public works. And I'd like to ask if you have served or have served in our city public works department in engineering, street traffic, solid waste, or administration, would you please stand so we can recognize you? Anybody? Well, let's just give this group of servants a round of applause. In there. Thank you for joining us for this presentation of Worship at First Christian Church in Johnson City, Tennessee. We're grateful for this opportunity to minister to you by way of television, and you're invited to be with us in person at any time. Our worship times and much more information about First Christian can be found on our website, www.fcc-jc.org, or you can call us at 423-232-5700. The church is located at 200 East Mount Castle Drive in Johnson City, Tennessee. This has been a production of First Christian Church Television Ministries.